Hello, in this lecture we will continue on chapter 18 and we're going to start off with cost classification. So types of cost classifications, classification by behavior. So when we think about managerial accounting, one of the first things we want to do is to break up the costs in terms of the behavior of the cost, the types of costs that are there. And this will become apparent when we start to think about decision making. So one of the types of classifications we want to think about is fixed cost versus variable cost. So we defined fixed cost versus variable cost by the relationship of the cost to changes in production. So if we think about if we're making hamburgers, then if we sell the hamburger for $10, then of course the revenue we know goes up by how many burgers we sell. So however many burgers we sell times $10, the revenue goes up in constant increments of $10. If we think about variable costs, they behave in the same fashion as the way the sales go up in that they will change with the number of burgers. So if we're thinking about the meat and the bun and everything that goes together in terms of the materials, the direct materials in that case, to make the hamburger, then if those cost $6, then those will go up in, in a constant relationship to the numbers of burgers sold. So if we're thinking about in terms of a managerial accounting decision making, we're really trying to compare the sales price in that case to the variable costs oftentimes and seeing if the burger is 10 and 4, then we're getting uh, 10 and 6, then we're walking away with $4 in essence. So that's how we might be thinking in terms of a management mental accounting decision in terms of variable costs. Then if we think about fixed costs, they do not behave the same. So if we think about the rent in the area, if the rent is $1,000 a month, then it doesn't matter how many burgers we sell. If the rent on the restaurant is $1,000, is then we're going to pay $1,000 whether we sell one hamburger or whether we sell a 1,000 hamburgers. So that cost is going to be constant. It's going to be fixed. So when we think about managerial accounting, then oftentimes we're going to try to say, okay, well, what is my sales price over my variable cost? That will be called the contribution margin. In this case, it was $4 per burger. And then the question is, well, how many burgers do we have to sell in order to clear the fixed costs which will be constant from month to month. And that's one reason and one way that we would define variable costs and fixed costs and why we would do that on the managerial accounting side of things. So types of cost classifications um, by traceability. So we have direct costs. Direct costs are traceable to a single cost object. So materials labor. So the most direct costs in terms of making a hamburger is generally going to be the materials that will be used in the burger can be applied directly to that as well as the labor that is given in terms of creating the burger. Indirect costs, however, costs that cannot be traced to a, uh, to a single cost object. So, for example, the maintenance department. So if the maintenance department uh, did the maintenance on both the executive side of the office as well as the manufacturing side of the office, then the, where do we allocate that cost to the uh, executive side or the manufacturing process? So when we don't can't tie the uh, process directly to a, a, a specific process, the cost to a specific process, then it will be indirect. We're going to have to find some way to apply that cost. Comparing product and period costs. Okay, so when we think about product and period costs, right now we're thinking about a manufacturing company. So we're thinking about producing things. If we think about a basic, like a hamburger production, we can start there and then talk about different types of production. And if we think about producing a product, we can uh, think about the types of things that will go directly into the product and we won't have any problem with really determining that those costs are in the product, such as direct labor. So the person who was actually working on the production, if it was hamburgers and we had one person just doing the hamburgers and that's all they're doing, their labor is clearly part of that hamburger. That hamburger's production includes the labor of that individual. When we sell it, that labor should be included in the sales price because their labor is in the production. Direct materials, of course, anything that goes into the product directly. If it's a hamburger, then we're talking about you know, the bun, the meat, the whatever else that goes directly in there, that should be, of course, part of the sales price. That should be worked into the calculation of the sales price and the cost of the product because it is directly applied to it. The manufacturing overhead is a little bit more difficult. We are going to try to apply anything within the production. So if there was the rent on the kitchen, that would be applied to the burger if we could. 
but it's a little bit more difficult to apply to individual burgers. So how do we do that allocation process? A supervisor's salary might be a little bit more difficult if they're supervising different areas. How do we allocate their supervision to a specific product? But we will try to do that. The manufacturing overhead, we're going to try to allocate to the product. So those are the three things that will always be involved in the production process. When we think about inventory, when we think about us making any type of inventory, whether it be cars, if we're producing cars, we're producing guitars, then it's going to include direct labor, direct material, manufacturing overhead within the cost of the things that we are producing. Then we're going to have period costs. And the period costs are often going to be the selling type of cost and the administrative costs. And most of the time, much of the time, we're going to think about the production process, meaning compare the sales to the production that, that we are doing. And then we're going to think about the period costs separately. And in the most part, the period costs are often more standard or more fixed in nature. So we're going to see the production process, how many do we have to produce and, and generate revenue to clear the production process, and then how many do we have to produce to clear the selling and administrative. So that's the format that our income statement uh, will start to look like. The selling are going to be fixed, of course, on the selling uh, costs, and the administrative costs are going to be the things like the accounting department, like the management office, which is not geared directly towards the production process. They make decisions on how to uh, manage the production process, but of course those costs cannot be directly derived or, or tied to the production process itself. So if we think about it in terms of this pictorial format, if we have the year 2015 costs incurred, the period costs, which again are going to be the selling costs and the uh, administrative costs, are generally going to be their expense just as we've seen in the service companies in the past, meaning uh, they're going to be expensed in the period incurred and they'll be part of the operating expenses on the income statement in that period, decreasing net income at that time. If we think about production costs, on the other hand, note that they can in include the same types of things that we thought of as period costs before, such as wages. If we think about wages, if the wages were too um, someone in the accounting department, then it would be a period cost. We would expense it when we pay the individual. However, if we are paying wages to someone who makes inventory, if we make cars and we pay a, a producer of the car, the person that works directly on that automobile, we're not going to expense it as wages. We're going to put his labor in his or her labor into the production of the car. So it's going to be in terms of an asset. And then that asset is now going to be inventory. And that inventory, if it's sold in 2015, then we will expense that labor, that overhead, and uh, those direct materials in the form of cost of goods sold. So it will be expensed, but it won't be expensed until it's sold. If it was sold in 2015, then those costs will be, will be expensed and the form of cost of goods sold at that time. If, however... The inventory is not sold on production. The car is still sitting there on the lot at the end of 2015, or it's not completed at the end of 2015, then it's going to be in ending inventory. So all the stuff that's involved, including wages, including depreciation in the manufacturing process, will be included in ending inventory as of the end of 2015. Hopefully it will then be sold in 2016, at which time we will then expense all that information when it is sold in the form of cost of goods sold. So if we think of some examples then, if we're thinking about uh, fixed or variable, direct or indirect, and uh, product or period costs for bicycle tires, if we produce the bicycle wheels, then the costs are variable by the bike. Uh, direct or indirect, they're direct in terms of the production of the bike. Uh, product costs or period costs, they're product costs because they are part of the bike that we are making and manufacturing. Wages for the assembly worker, variable, because they're going to change in terms of the production process for the most part. Direct or indirect is direct because it's right in the bike process. That means that we are going to put it as part of inventory and not expense those wages. Product or period, it's product because those expenses are directly tied to the production of the bike. Advertising, we're going to say it's fixed in this case. It's going to be the same per year. Direct or indirect, we're going to say it is indirect because it's not, uh, we don't, we're not going to tie it directly out to a specific department. We, it could affect multiple areas. Product or period, this is going to be a period cost, meaning, and for the most part, we're going to expense it when 
it is incurred as a period cost, not tie it to the production process. Production manager's salary is going to be fixed and because uh, it's usually a salary, so that means it's going to be a fixed cost no matter how many uh, bikes or whatever we are making, we make. <laughs> direct or indirect, it's an indirect cost because once again, we, it does, it's not tied directly to the amount of bikes that we make. Therefore, it's indirect. And it's going to be a product cost because the supervisor is in the production process, although his salary does not change, the cost does not change with the level of production, as does the uh, salary or the wages of a factory worker. Office depreciation is going to be fixed because depreciation is the depreciation on the office. It's going to be the same uh, no matter what, no matter how many we produce. Is it uh, direct or indirect? It's going to be indirect because it could be in multiple areas, multiple departments. We have to somehow allocate it to departments, production or period. And this, it's going to be a period cost in this case because it's on the office, not on the factory. So oftentimes that's going to be a distinction you want to keep in mind. Is it on the factory or the office? On the factory depreciation, on the other hand, it's still going to be fixed. Uh, it's still going to be indirect because we can't apply it to a direct production process, but it will be part of the product. It is part of the production process. We just can't tie it to any individual bike. It doesn't change with the production of the bike, but it now is depreciation on the factory. Therefore, we want to include it in the cost of the inventory as opposed to the depreciation on the office, which we're just going to expense the way we have in the past in the form of a period cost. So oil and gas applied to gears and change, chains, it's going to be variable. It's going to be indirect because the reason that's indirect is because uh, even though we apply it to each bike and it might go up in a constant rate in terms of how many bikes we make, it's small. We're not going to count how much oil, you know, the pennies and the hay pennies that would be involved in the oil per bike. Therefore, it would be too tedious to do that. So we're going to call it indirect and we're going to apply it in the form of overhead the same way we would do for like the factory rent. And we'll talk more about that as we go. And it's going to be a product cost. Sales commission varies. So that's going to be a variable cost, even though it's part of the selling area, which is oftentimes more fixed in nature. And then it's going to be indirect. And it's going to be a period cost because it is a period cost, even though uh, it is variable in this case. So cost concepts for service companies. So we've been talking about the terms we've been looking at are applied to a manufacturing company. Many of the terms will still apply to service companies, but not in quite as much detail. So a service company clearly will not have the inventory information that we're thinking about, but could still have variable costs and would still want to think about things in terms of variable versus fixed costs when we think about managerial process and decision making. So the cost concepts described are generally applicable to service organizations. For example, the cost of beverages for passenger Southwest Airlines is a variable cost based on the number of passengers. So when we think about uh, an airline, which is a service for the most part, we're providing the service of flight. They still have some variable costs. They're saying that the beverages are going to be variable in terms of how many customers they have. So they can still think about these concepts in terms of variable costs versus fixed costs when uh, thinking about management process. We also want to think about prime and conversion costs. And this will be important uh, when we start thinking about the manufacturing process. So if we think about, remember, when we think about inventory, when we think about producing inventory, when we make our own inventory, what goes into that inventory? It's not just the materials. When we think about a car, it does include the uh, materials going into the car, which would be the steel and whatnot that we make the car out of. But a huge piece of it also, of course, is direct labor. So when we think about the price of the car, uh, the, the raw material is not a car. <laughs> the, the huge piece of it that goes into the car will be the labor and the maintenance that makes the car, whether it be automated or whether it be a human capital. That conversion process is a huge part and value of the car. And then we have the uh, manufacturing overhead. So obviously, if it was, if it was all automated, then the uh, manufacturing overhead, the maintenance on the machine, would be the huge part of the production of a, a car. But this conversion, the conversion concept, is a huge piece of the asset. And we're going to have to capitalize those 
those types of costs in the form of inventory, whereas before we would have expensed them. So the labor that goes into the car will be part of inventory and will not be expensed. So if we think about this, then uh, the prime costs of the car are going to be the direct material, the direct labor, the stuff that goes directly into the car. The conversion costs are the things that change the car from the raw material to the end product. And notice we have an overlap of the direct labor. The direct labor is both a prime cost, the primary cost of the car, and it's also part of the conversion process, part of the movement of the car from the raw material to the finished product as is the overhead and remember what the overhead is going to be we'll talk about more of overhead a lot in the future it's going to be the things that we could not apply directly to any individual inventory items such as a car such as the depreciation on the factory such as the oil which is too small of a, an information so we're going to have to somehow allocate it to each car in a different way uh, the depreciation on the factory the supervisor's salary all these things are part of the car in terms of cost of the car but we can't apply them to a particular car and we will have to look for a way to apply them more broadly to each car.